So good afternoon and welcome to the afternoon session, which is on the past and future of ethics. Our first speaker is Dr. Daniel Slamacy, and Dan is the Kilbride Clinton Professor of Medicine and Ethics at the University of Chicago, both in the Department of Medicine and the Divinity School. He's also Associate Director of the McLean Center for Clinical and Medical Ethics, as well as the Director of the Program on Medicine and Religion. Dan has previously held faculty positions at New York Medical College and Georgetown University, and he has served on numerous government advisory commissions. He was appointed to the Presidential Commission for the Study of Bioethical Issues by President Obama in 2010, and his research interests encompass both theoretical and empirical investigations of the ethics of end-of-life decision-making, ethics education, and spirituality in medicine. He is the author or editor of six books, including The Healer's Calling, Methods of Medical Ethics, The Rebirth of a Clinic, and Safe Passage, a Global Spiritual Source Book for Care at the End of Life. Dan also serves as the editor-in-chief of the journal Theoretical Medicine and Bioethics. And today, Dan will speak to us on a topic, the history and ethics of US STD experiments in Guatemala, 1946-1948. Thanks to those of you who uh, took a shorter lunch break and got uh, got here. Um, uh, when I was uh, asked to uh, speak for this session, um, Mark gave me a, uh, a somewhat directed assignment um, in that he wanted me to say something from the, our experience on the Presidential Commission for the Study of Bioethical Issues. And I chose this topic partly because while many people have heard about these experiments, um, I still find there are huge numbers of people who really are uh, don't uh, have never heard uh, about this uh, work that the US government did and secondly those who have don't really know the details and I thought it would be valuable even though it's not sort of uh, late breaking news to go uh, to go through this uh, the story I'm going to tell you really um, by is credited to uh, the historian at uh, Wellesley College, Susan Reverby, who spent her entire career studying the Tuskegee uh, experiments and um, decided that she was going to ask the question, what were these guys, and in those days they were all guys, doing uh, before they were in Tuskegee? Um, and she began to investigate the work done by one investigator, John Cutler. Um, she uh, published some preliminary or, or made some preliminary reports in October 2010 on his work in Guatemala after the Second World War and first published it um, in the Journal of Political History in uh, 2011. Um, and the details that I'll get into in a few minutes were, um, uh, here's Dr. Cutler, um, were so great um, that, um, uh, th that actually President Obama decided he would ask the commission to do two projects, one which was to uh, investigate the history of what actually happened in Guatemala, and the second to give a contemporary assessment of what research protections are currently um, in place. And it's really the first of these that I'm going to talk to you about this afternoon. Um, to understand this, I think we have to go back to uh, a little bit in time and try to understand uh, the late 1940s medical milieu. Um, there was a war on venereal disease. It was a scourge that we now reserve for diseases like cancer, perhaps like HIV. Um, but the war on syphilis was in full gear, and this had uh, occurred just after the Second uh, World War. Penicillin had only been had been discovered in 1928. But but had not been shown to be effective for syphilis until 1943 and was, had mostly been used for, uh, for soldiers. And there was a great deal of scientific work going on, some of it got getting into the newspapers. Um, and in 1947, a New York Times uh, correspondent, uh, Waldemar Kampfert, reported on some syphilis experiments that had occurred in rabbits, which seemed to be um, promising. And he said it would be ethically impossible uh, to undertake such research and to shoot living syphilis germs into human bodies, unquote, um, in that article. Um, little um, did Mr. Kempfert know. 
Um, the United States government, in cooperation with the Guatemalan uh, government, um, undertook a series of studies in Guatemala. One set were serological, better understanding uh, the cerebral spinal uh, fluid tests and blood tests for syphilis, and to better understand what happened over time with or without treatment, sort of what was already beginning uh, to happen in Tuskegee. But then secondly, um, to conduct exposure studies, uh, originally trying to say how could we prophylax against people getting venereal disease with either a topical solution um, or with giving penicillin before contact, and then it later shifted uh, to uh, treatment experiments. The serologic studies were, uh, went on um, for quite some, uh, some time, began in 46. Um, the purpose was to develop better tests for syphilis, blood draws, lumbar punctures, cisternal punctures, and the populations studied were orphans, uh, leprosarium patients, and some US Air Force personnel who were stationed in Guatemala. Um, but the intentional exposure studies um, were short-lived, 46 to 48. Um, they involved commercial sex workers, prisoners, Guatemalan soldiers, and hospitalized psychiatric patients. And here's basically what they did. Um, they first tried to induce, uh, uh, transmit the infection by having people engage in intercourse with infected prostitutes to try to get experimental models in human beings for, for syphilis and gonorrhea. When that was proved not efficient enough, quote unquote, um, they then um, uh, made direct genital skin contact with um, uh, solutions of these uh, uh, bacteria. Um, and then, when that wasn't efficient enough, went to direct injection um, of uh, uh, suspensions of the bacteria into the urethra um, of the subjects, quote unquote, of these, disease, of these studies. And when that wasn't efficient enough, engaged in what they called gentle scarification and abrasion to increase the efficiency of the infection rate, thinking that would more um, mimic um, actual intercourse. Um, and then, uh, they moved to something called um, cisternal punctures, which was actually not something that our researchers, who were not physicians, actually um, understood. Um, but they actually uh, injected um, um, spirochetes directly into the cisterna magna um, as a model for neurosyphilis, because it would take too long to wait 10 or 15 years for the natural course of things to develop it. And they also thought it might be um, an experimental shock therapy for the psychiatric patients uh, into whom they were doing. It. And again, for those of you who don't know what this is, this is a cisterna magna puncture. Um, emulsions of spirochetes directly um, injected into this uh, cerebrospinal fluid. There is um, uh, no record of any of these subjects giving consent. Um, some subjects, including those with mental illness and children, didn't have the capacity to give consent. Um, evidence shows that researchers intentionally deceived some subjects about the nature of the study and what was being uh, done to them. Um, there's one quote uh, relating to the um, native uh, Central Americans uh, as being only confused by explanations and knowing what's happening, so it's better not um, to engage in informed consent. These were not rogue experiments done by um, people who had no um, backing. Um, the uh, Public Health Services Venereal Disease Division, now the Centers for Disease Control, um, was very much involved and provided a large amount of the funding. Uh, the National Institutes of Health, which had only been recently been founded, um, was um, uh, very much involved in this, and study sections approved this research. The Pan American Sanitary Bureau and the Guatemalan government um, were all um, uh, involved in these projects. Um, and it went pretty far up the chain of command. Um, uh, the um, meeting one of the NIH uh, syphilis study section, when it was first founded, approved these studies. Uh, the National uh, Advisory Health Council um, uh, approved the studies. And Surgeon uh, General at the time, Thomas Parent, uh, approved these studies. There were site visits, like any other uh, experiment, from the uh, PHS Venereal Disease Research Lab and from the NIH Chief Division of Research Grants to see how the project was progressing. Staffing um, came directly from the Public Health Service of the United States, um, as well as uh, from the uh, government of Guatemala. 
Um, some idea of the magnitude of this, um, uh, 5,500 uh, uh, persons were um, enrolled in these projects. Uh, the intentional um, exposure studies um, involved 1,300 uh, patients. Only in 678 of these cases was there any evidence of any attempt at treatment, and usually that would be inadequate by current um, standards. And then in diagnostic testing, there were 5,000 um, uh, subjects, um, only 820 of whom show any record of any sort of treatment. Uh, these, uh, the age range was pretty great. An intentional exposure includes a 10-year-old Guatemalan soldier um, who was part of the intentional exposure studies up to the age of 72 in a psychiatric patient. Um, uh, and the uh, mean age was 25. Uh, diagnostic testing was largely done um, in children. To give you an idea um, uh, of how detailed the records were and uh, what uh, sorts of things happened, we'll give you a profile that we uh, culled from the, the records of a patient uh, simply named Berta, um, who was in February of 1948 um, involved first in intentional exposure to syphilis experiments. And then if you move to uh, the uh, right hand uh, column, um, uh, on August 23rd, Dr. Cutler wrote that Berta appeared as if she was going to die, but he didn't specify why. Uh, that same day, he put gonorrheal pus from a male subject into both of Berta's eyes, as well as into her urethra and rectum. He also reinfected her with syphilis. Several days later, Berta's eyes were filled with pus from the gonorrhea. She was bleeding from the urethra, um, and four days later, um, she died. Now, um, let's try to even step back a little bit from that uh, story to show that there have been um, other intentional exposure experiments. Um, in fact, Albert Neiser, um, a, a Prussian uh, a physician um, 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 at the late 19th into the early 20th century, um, had worked with uh, prostitutes trying to treat syphilis, taking serum from prostitutes and trying to um, uh, uh, treat them. He did that um, uh, um, uh, in, and, and was actually prosecuted uh, by the Prussian government um, in 1898. And as far as I know, actually it was not, as we sometimes think in the United States, uh, the uh, 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 Benjamin Cardoza um, in the famous um, uh, 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 New York Hospital um, uh, court decision uh, that thought up the idea of informed consent. It was actually the Prussian government in prosecuting Albert Neiser who said that you didn't ask any of these people uh, their permission before you injected them uh, with um, syphilis and injected them with serum from uh, prostitutes who were infected with it. But of course, one of the things that was most shocking um, to me um, is that the experiments that were going on in Guatemala were happening roughly contemporaneously um, with the trial of the Nazi uh, physicians. And while I had been aware, as many of you may have been aware, uh, of the experiments that were done, horrific experiments in, um, uh, in high altitude exposure and in a cold exposure, um, the indictment against these physicians physicians also included um, experiments that were done by Nazi physicians on concentration camp uh, victims uh, where they inoculated their muscles uh, with clostridia and streptococci and then when that wasn't efficient enough um, in language that eerily parallels the language in, uh, in Guatemala, they actually purposefully abraded the wounds um, and inserted glass to simulate shrapnel which might make the infection more like the battlefield infection they thought they were going to uh, treat. And again, I want to suggest that this had um, approval from the highest levels of the government. Thomas Perrin, the U.S. Surgeon General, is quoted in a letter as having said to one of the site um, visitors, you know, we couldn't do such an experiment in this country, unquote, um, in congratulating them on the work that they were doing. Cutler, um, after um, his work in Guatemala, went on to Tuskegee and then went on to the University of Pittsburgh where he became uh, Dean of the School of, uh, of Public Health. Now, um, 
in our report, um, uh, we um, made um, these conclusions at least. Um, uh, in my view, and I'll get to this in a minute, I think they're at least minimal um, comments that we, uh, we could make. Um, this certainly from a scientific point of view could be criticized and uh, several scientists uh, told us that they basically didn't have very good information in these studies. Um, second, you can certainly criticize them for a failure to obtain informed consent, which was known about at least since the time um, of Albert, uh, Albert Neiser, um, also um, was done um, in experiments that were done um, in the Terre Haute prison by the public health service even before they went to Guatemala. At least American prisoners were being asked to obtain informed consent before engaging in experiments which were not even anywhere near as horrendous is the ones that were done in Guatemala. And um, we thought that the individual investigators, not just what they did, but the individual investigators themselves could be held morally culpable, um, that these failures were not just wrong now, but that they were wrong then, and they should have known they were wrong, and in fact, many of their efforts to cover it up, and for instance, keeping this secret and never publishing it, um, gave some credence to the belief that they actually had some inkling that others would think that what they were doing was wrong. And that much you can find anytime you uh, would like at www.bioethics.gov slash studies. We have um, um, our uh, report available for you uh, there online. You can also order them uh, from, the, from the government. But I'd like to take us for a few moments a little bit um, into ethical analysis beyond um, the report uh, itself, which I think, um, even as a member of the uh, commission, um, was somewhat minimal. Um, we didn't really raise questions of justice um, in terms of what went on uh, there. Um, and quotes like, you know we couldn't uh, do such an experiment in this country and Indians are only confused by explanations and knowing what is happening, um, suggests uh, that the US government um, and its investigators were holding a different standard um, in Guatemala than they would uh, use um, in the United States. Um, and similars were not being treated uh, similarly. In addition, I would go further, perhaps from our report, and say that these were gross violations of human dignity um, for the subjects. Um, particularly disturbing for me were the really dispassionate discussions of the need to increase the efficiency of the infection that led to the pre-inoculation genital abrasion. It was almost as if one was reading about um, laboratory animals, the, this, this sort of dispassionate tone um, of, the, uh, of the primary sources. Um, and prostitutes um, were not treated and were used as reservoirs. I mean, sort of like animal reservoirs for other kinds of diseases. They were simply continually used as sources for fresh, infective um, material, um, which again seems um, to be a gross violation of the dignity of the persons um, who were um, involved in these experiments. Um, the question is always raised, um, and I think we need to continually raise it for ourselves, whether a beneficent social end justifies any and every scientific means. Um, certainly it seems to me that if you are at, um, at least in any way uh, inclined to think that Kant had um, something to say that was reasonable when he said that act in such a way that you treat humanity, whether in your own person or in the person of another, always and at the same time as an end and never simply as a means, um, would cast a severe judgment um, on these sorts of experiments, despite um, how you know, the, the uh, investigators themselves thought they were doing something very noble, which was continuing the war on syphilis and gonorrhea, the war on venereal disease. Um, I wonder um, whether our um, report went far enough in declaring that these actions were unconscionable. Um, could we have used the phrase crimes against humanity? Um, or a phrase like atrocities. There was some discussion of this within the, co the commission. We decided in the end on saying unconscionable, uh, but maybe um, uh, there were those at least who sided with me that thought that that didn't go far enough. There were others, and maybe some of you in the room, who think it goes too far. Um, particularly the question of whether one can assign retrospective individual blame to Dr. Cutler um, and his colleagues. 
Um, the question arises of whether we're holding them to uh, a standard that we now have but didn't really exist for them at the time. Um, I can tell you that, for instance, the uh, American uh, uh, um, Sexually Transmitted Disease Association removed Thomas Perrin's name from its Career Development Award for his endorsement of these experiments. And Pitt took Cutler's name off a lecture series, even from uh, their knowledge of Tuskegee, before even this was discovered. But there are those persons who might suggest, and I'd be glad to talk about this, whether this is historical anachronism. Uh, the doctrine of informed consent as we now have it had not fully been formulated. The um, a Nuremberg Code had not actually been written, um, although it is odd that we at least thought it existed enough that we were able to try Nazi physicians for not having um, uh, uh, behaved in a way that was consistent with those sorts of principles. Um, and then persons suggested it maybe wasn't fair um, to, in essence, try these persons without giving them a, a chance to defend themselves since uh, they were all deceased. Another issue that comes up um, and continues to come up is whether there should be compensation um, for uh, these experiments, or if not compensation, at least reparations. Um, um, compensation being to individual victims, reparations perhaps to the, uh, to the nation. The U.S. government did give $1.8 million for public health in Guatemala, um, well, along with an apology from uh, the, uh, the president. Um, does that go far enough, given uh, the extent of, uh, of what went on? Uh, the alleged surviving victims, um, and it's not clear whether they are or not, um, that's, um, but, but to the extent that we can believe that they are surviving victims, um, tried to sue the U.S. government, but um, it is actually unconstitutional for foreigners to sue the U.S. government, so they were blocked in district court in 2012. You may be aware this is still going on. Uh, they um, have now launched a lawsuit against uh, Johns Hopkins because Hopkins was so involved in the NIH and the war on syphilis and the um, uh, funding and the approval for these uh, for these studies. Um, I think it's a $400 million lawsuit um, that is being uh, heard now. And then lastly, um, mostly for, uh, for, for me, um, um, I began, began this project uh, for thinking, you know, you know, raise your hands if you think this was the right, uh, you know, legitimate thing to do. I mean, it seemed like an ethical no-brainer that this was horrific um, um, and should never have been, uh, never have been done. Um, but I began to really become interested in the question of how things like this happen. I mean, these men actually thought themselves heroes. Um, this is not the Aristotelian problem of a crazier where one knows what the right thing is to do and can't bring oneself to do it. Um, perhaps it's explained by Hannah Arendt's um, idea um, of the banality of evil, but I'm not even sure that that properly captures what went on. Um, maybe, in fact, what's going on um, and sometimes goes on for any of us um, is a problem of self-deception. Um, for instance, um, the terrorists um, who carried out the atrocities um, yesterday in France probably thought that they were doing something noble and good. Um, how does one come to think that? Um, and the errant experimenter, I think, believes that the exploitation, uh, what we come to think of as the exploitation of innocence, is actually just, justified um, by the, the nobility of the end. And there are some implications for the present. What is the sort of balance between social good and the good of individuals in the biomedical research that we conduct? Um, I think we need to continually ask ourselves those questions so that this historical um, example is not something that is simply dead and in the past. Um, we certainly need moral formation and ethical education um, for, uh, for scientists. Um, I think we need to be a bit more transparent about our research. Um, and I think some of us worry about the current offshoring of research, particularly pharmaceutical uh, research in a globalized world, and what we don't know is happening um, in the developing world now. Um, so with uh, that, I'll uh, end my presentation. It gives me um, two or three minutes, I guess, for questions. So thanks. <clears throat> Question or comment? Sorry to put that on you after lunch. Um, <laughs> pretty, pretty gruesome stuff. Okay, well maybe. Yes. 
Go. Oh, um, tell us a little bit more about why the commission did not turn out more strongly. Uh, Marshall's question, if you didn't hear it in the back, is why the commission didn't come out more strongly. I think there were some philosophical questions raised about whether we could legitimately hold persons to standards that uh, that didn't exist um, um, at. Uh, at the time, um, uh, and um, um, and I think there may also have been fear about what kind of liability the United States might be put at in even international courts by having the commission come out with a stronger kind of uh, kind of condemnation. Um, but there were, you know, there were actually legitimate um, philosophical differences about that question of whether we can hold persons to standards um, that uh, didn't exist at the time. Um, I kept trying to insist that, um, uh, you know, Hippocrates would have thought that putting a needle into somebody's brain and injecting spirochetes into it <laughs> was something a doctor shouldn't do and that anybody who was um, as a physician would know that this was something that was morally wrong, even if we didn't have a doctrine of informed consent, um, but it was not ultimately uh, the persuasive view. Yes? Aside from the Nazi experiments, mm -hmm. was there a precedental tradition to infect people with diseases Got it. Um, I, well, I told you it goes back into the late 19th century with Neiser, who was purposefully infecting um, uh, um, uh, uh, prostitutes with uh, with syphilis, and then trying to treat the uh, treat them with. Um, the serum of prostitutes who were also um, infected. So, so this has happened, uh, and there were other, yeah, there were other ones uh, here. I mean, there have been, you know, experiments. Uh, um, there's a lot of, in, of, certainly, of research that's done, um, even to this day, with uh, with actual um, induction of infections. I mean, how do you study malaria except by having people um, bitten by malarious um, mosquitoes and try to see whether or not the um, uh, the latest attempt you have at uh, a um, uh, at a vaccine is actually um, um, effective or the treatment is effective. Um, and great volunteers who are trying to do these sorts of things, they're usually attenuated, you know, so that they're not going to get um, um, sick from it, but still those kinds of things do go on. So, yes, time. Thank you. Thank you.